Hey, it's Dr. Rob. Welcome to Biblical Genetics. On today's episode, genetic entropy and simple organisms. I get a lot of questions about evolution versus creation. I get a lot of questions about this idea that the creationists have that mutations build up in populations over time to the point where all species should go extinct. Now, that's completely contrary to what Darwin said, but is it true? Do things decay over time? Can we apply entropy to life? That's an excellent question. But before I get to in the future, on some future episode, uh, the question of genetic entropy in humans and you know panda bears and, and large complex organisms, we have to start at the other end with the simple organisms because it might be, maybe, that bacteria can escape genetic entropy. Now I came to this waterfall on purpose because it's a good illustration of genetic entropy. We don't see from one day to the next much erosion happening in this spot. This waterfall will be slowly carved over many thousands of years, one little grain in the rock at a time. And slowly, 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 a notch will form here. Maybe the pool will get larger. And, you know, just erosion is really slow. The same thing happens in genetics. Change is slow. Mutation buildup is slow. We don't see you know, massive species just disappearing because of mutation accumulation overnight. These things take time. And therefore, this whole question really is a question about philosophy and science. It's difficult to measure these things. The theory of genetic entropy was really designed to address the question of the long-term survival of complex organisms like humans and elephants. Things with very complex genomes with relatively small population sizes and very slow reproduction rates. Those are the types of organisms that are targeted by mutation, and those are the ones that will have the hardest time surviving over long periods of time. On the other end of the spectrum, we have bacteria with very fast reproduction rates, very simple genomes, extremely high population numbers. It is theoretically possible that bacteria can escape the ravages of genetic entropy. And I've already done some genetic entropy stuff on the show and there's more coming in the future, you can guarantee that. But I want to ease ourselves into this by talking about how these things work and we can use bacteria as a very good example. Now I can think of five reasons why bacteria might escape genetic entropy. First, they have a very low mutation rate. The DNA polymerases that copy the bacterial DNA, they make about a mistake every 10 million letters or so but like the E. coli genome is only four or five million letters long. So there's less than one mutation per generation per bacterium. That's not true in humans where we have 60 to 100 or more mutations per generation, but bacteria, it's less than one. It's conceivable that there are bacteria in the world today that have the same exact genomes that God initially created. Now, I gotta put a giant caveat on that because there's not really anything called the E. coli genome. We're now talking about things like the pan genome. Because you could have two bacteria right next to each other. One might have a gene the other doesn't have. One might have a, a met metabolic pathway the other doesn't have. And if you look at all the E. coli in the entire world, well, not every E. coli has the same genome, therefore we talk about a pan genome. And yet putting that aside, it is still possible that there are non-mutant bacteria swimming around in someone's gut somewhere on this planet even today. The second thing that can help bacteria survive the ravages of genetic entropy is their population size. Now, I don't know how many E. coli are in the world today, and I actually Googled this trying to figure it out, and I couldn't come up with a good answer. I'm gonna pick a number. I'm gonna say one quadrillion. Now, I don't know if that's true. It's just a big number. But if you think about it, Bacteria reproduce very quickly. In fact, they can reproduce, let's say, every 30 minutes. That means that every 30 minutes, about a quadrillion E. coli die. To better explain that, let's use people as an example. Imagine that people reproduce by binary fission. We just divided right down the middle, and a new person popped up, two identical people from one. And let's say this happens every 30 minutes. Well, there are 7.5 billion people in the world today. In order to keep the population at 7.5 billion, if it doubles every 30 minutes, you're going to have to kill off 7.5 billion people every 30 minutes. That kind of reproduction rate 
is excellent for natural selection. Now people don't do that, but bacteria do. And if bacteria reproduce that quickly, that means that if there's a slight difference from one bacterium to another, it actually might make a difference in their reproduction over the long term. That's kind of what Darwin considered. Let me read you a quote from his 1868 book, Variations of Plants and Animals Under Domestication. He said, The severe and often recurrent struggle for life will determine that those variations, however slight, which are favorable, shall be preserved or selected, and those which are unfavorable shall be destroyed. Darwin's main idea is that organisms can produce many more offspring that can possibly survive. Since that's true, and it is, he thought the natural selection then could step in, and if one offspring has a slight advantage over another, that one over the long course of time will have more offspring in general. He also factored in that the environment is very complicated. He said if living things vary even in a slight degree, if in the long course of ages inheritable variations ever arise in any way advantageous to any being under its excessively complex and changing relations of life, then the severe and often recurrent struggle for life will determine that those variations, however slight or favorable, shall be preserved or selected. Okay, you got the idea? Lots of offspring, very complex environments, lots of noise in the system, and because of all that noise, natural selection has a hard time seeing the variations. It takes a very strong variation in humans to make a big difference over the long term. But in bacteria, with their low mutation rates, with their vast population sizes, and with their very fast population turnover, this recipe might actually apply. But there are a couple of other things we have to consider when we're talking about bacteria. And these things actually operate opposite each other. Interestingly, it's like a, a tug of war between these two opposing ideas. First, bacteria have vastly simpler genomes than more complex organisms. Our genes, they have a start and a stop. They have places where the, the letters in the DNA are coded to bond to a protein. It's called a histone that the DNA wraps around. If you change that letter, you might change the histone bonding pattern and the DNA might fold differently and that might actually affect genetic expression. Bacteria don't have histones. We also have things in the middle of our genes called introns. In order to make a protein, you have to cut the introns out and throw them away. But at the place where the intron joins the regular part of the gene, there's these little signals that say, hey, cut me out right here. Well, if you change that letter, you might have just destroyed the whole protein. That's not true in bacteria. The target for mutation in bacteria is much smaller. On the other hand, because bacteria don't have much of what we call non-coding, the old-fashioned term for that was junk DNA, but they don't have a lot of non-coding DNA. Most of their genomes are actually are functional. This produces a protein, this produces a protein, this produces a protein. Therefore, any single letter change has a higher probability of directly affecting the organism. So, because they can be more affected by mutation, natural selection can see that mutation more clearly, and it can filter it out. It's as if bacteria are bicycles and humans are sports cars. You can make some changes to a bicycle that doesn't affect the bicycle, fine. But there are a lot of changes to that bicycle because it has fewer working parts that would be catastrophic. You can't lose the chain, you can't lose the handlebars, you can't lose the tires. But in an automobile, because there are so many different working parts and a lot of those parts have nothing to do with getting that car down the road. You could have one flat tire. You can still drive, usually, maybe not safely, but you can still make the car go. You can break the windshield. You can lose the hubcap. There's all these things that can happen in the car that don't totally destroy the car. You see, genetic entropy is more like rust. Imagine that you are a 100-year-old car and your owner has taken very good care of you. Every five years, he changes your tires. Every six months, he changes your oil. He changes your spark plugs every couple of years. He's giving you new windshields every time it's cracked. He's taken very good care of you. Maybe he even parked you in a garage so you're not getting wet all the time. But none of that matters because you're still going to self-destruct. Because little teeny spots of rust will be building up in your undercarriage. One little piece of rust does nothing for the functionality of the car. Nothing at all. But if you had billions of little pieces of rust... You become nothing but rust. And that's the essence of genetic entropy. It's a buildup of 
small mutations that aren't visible in the natural world. Bacteria, because of the factors I just listed, might be able to escape that process. There's another really interesting factor about bacteria is that they can go dormant. Imagine a bacterium sinks to the bottom of a lake and now he's buried in mud and he's trapped there in a dormant state. And maybe a hundred years later, a fish comes by and pulls a worm out of the mud and stirs the, worm, the, the mud up and the bacterium now is now floating in the water again. Oh, well, you just introduced a bacteria that was asleep back into the water from a hundred years ago. The same thing might be true in Arctic permafrost. As permafrost melts, it releases bacteria into the wild that have been frozen for a very long time. There are ways to get bacteria from the past back into the present, so there's constantly a source of possibly non-mutated bacteria in the world. You know, one of the big miracles of life is that life exists at all. The fact that life, which is so contrary to the rules of nature, is actually here is only a testament to the Creator. But there's another interesting fact of life, and that is that life has still persisted. Imagine that you tried to build something like a robot. How long do you think your robot will survive? How long will it be able to go without intervention from you? What, an hour maybe before the battery burns out? Or what if you made a robot that could charge itself and could actually fix itself and make new robots? How long do you think those robots would go before some catastrophic thing happens and they can't, they can't exist anymore? I suspect not very long. The greatest inventions of humanity, using all of our brain power and the collective wisdom of thousands of years and millions of people, cannot build anything remotely similar to living things. Living things persist. Now, there is an end cap on the possible lifespan of complex organisms, but maybe not bacteria, and that, my friends, is a miracle. But all things are going downhill, and they will all go downhill eventually. We have no hope in this earth right here, but there's a great hope in the gospel. Look at what Jesus Christ says in the book of Revelation. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning or crying or pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Genetic entropy is a real thing, my friends, and the effects of it are very sad. Humans, over time, have picked up and will be in the future picking up even more mutations, birth defects, debilitating genetic diseases. This is sad. This is terrible. But do you know the Redeemer of all things? Do you know Jesus Christ who has promised to return to this earth and restore all things and set everything all right? He's going to remove all crying. He's going to remove genetic diseases. He's going to restore His people to a glorious state. And you can be there too. Well, thank you for listening. I know that was overly brief, but there will be more in the future. Stay tuned. In the meantime, if you'd like to find me on my Facebook group, Biblical Genetics, you can do so. I also have a Biblical Genetics group on MeWe. I'm also on Twitter. I'm also on Parler. You can find me. You can look up Robert Carter or Biblical Genetics. Sometimes it's one, sometimes it's the other, but I'm there. You can also look up my articles on genetic entropy and other articles by other people on genetic entropy on creation.com. And you know, if there's one thing good that came out of the year 2020, for me, it was my show Biblical Genetics. Thank you, fans, for your support, for your love, for your encouragement, for your financial support, for your prayer support. I could not have done this without you, and I'm doing this for you. Thank you also for sharing this program with other people. Thank you for those of you on YouTube for clicking the subscribe button and clicking the little bell to tell you when a new episode comes out, which so far this year I'm averaging about every week or every other week. For those of you listening on podcasts, I really appreciate you rating the show and talking to other people about it. Well, I'm going to leave you for now, and I'm going to see you again next year with some exciting brand new episodes of Biblical Genetics. And with all that I've learned this year, I can't wait to get started on next year.